I'm Evelyn Vanderhoof, and my Ida name is Kaju. I'm a weaver of the Northwest Coast textiles. There's a robe in the Peabody Museum in Harvard, and the first time I went there, I was with my mother, and she was weaving this raven's tail weaving, and I hadn't started weaving it. So when I started weaving this weave, I was living far away from the Northwest Coast. And so the Swift robe was the one I would always go to. So I just love this robe and I love its history. I, of course, did research and found out that it had been collected by a Captain Benjamin Swift uh, in the early 1800s. It was inspiring and I went deeper into the Northwest Coast textiles and I moved from this early way of weaving into the, the Nahim weaving, which the techniques allow for the smooth ovoids and U-forms and circles. But this technique, um, which we now call Raven's Tail, it used to be, they call it the Northern Geometric Weaving. And they called it the Northern Geometric Weaving because the Southern people, the Salish people along the Northwest Coast, had a different loom. The loom that they use has the double, there's a roller and then a, a lower roller and the warps are, are held tight and taut. Where this Northern loom is um, it's just very simple. It's a bar that is drilled one inch apart and the warp is hung free. So they often call this a gravity weighted loom because that's all that weighs the warps is the gravity. There's a lot of math that is involved in this kind of weaving. You have to graph your designs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. It was strictly a woman's art. The women came up with the patterns and the women prepared the warp. And originally it was created out of uh, mountain goat wool. In Haida Gwaii and even on Vancouver Island, historically there were no mountain goats. So the island and the coastal people would trade with uh, the people who lived near the mountain ranges. But today we use merino wool. The reason why I like to use merino wool is because it replicates the softness of the mountain goat. Everything has a purpose. And when you see designs, we're not thinking, is that a pretty design? Does that work compositionally? We're really emphasizing our, our ancestral stories. These geometric patterns had stories attached to them, had meaning attached to them. And and we put them in our robes so that we could wear our identity, we could wear our prestige, our, our social standing. The top pattern here is one of my favorites and the name of this pattern is All My Ancestors. So there are some patterns through the basketry that have remained and we know what their significance is. But this technique of weaving almost, well, been lost. So we're reaching back into ancestral time to see what were these patterns and how did these robes fit into um, the culture. What's exciting about this robe commission that I'm doing, they've asked me to be inspired by the Swift robe. And what's unique about the Swift robe is that the central pattern here is divided down the middle. So if you were to see a chief uh, from one side, you would see him, you'd think, oh, that's the robe you know, he's wearing. But then it, the people on the other side, they see a different pattern. And so that intrigued me. And so I looked back into um, the stories and there was a fellow who had come by to Haida Gwaii in the early 1900s and he collected the ancestor stories. And so I read and reread these stories and there was one that was really exciting about a fellow who wanted to show respect to his clan's people but disrespect to another group of people. And he told his clansmen, he said, 
I'm going to face this man, the castless. I'm going to face him with my ear that is has no earring. But I'm going to face my chiefs with my long abalone earring. I'm going to face my chiefs with, with that. And so just that little bit of part of that story gave me a clue as to why this swift rope might have had the design um, in half like that. It really uh, illustrates some of the reasoning and some of the ways that these ropes are patterned. It's a declaration of uh, not only your prestige and your social standing, but also it can tell you if you're respected or disrespected. Traditionally, the colors that we use for the raven's tail robes are the white of the mountain goat, and then this beautiful yellow is a hue that we get when we boil up a, what they call wolf moss. And again, that wolf moss is something that we trade with to the interior people on the mainland. It's a lichen that grows off of the of trees in the interior. The black, oftentimes you'll see these um, old Nahin robes. You'll see the black almost looks like a real deep red. And when I see that, that color in the museum pieces, I know that they used uh, hemlock and alder. But sometimes you'll see a real cold black. And that I will know that they probably used a charcoal or maybe even a, more of a mineral to get that black. The blue of the textiles and the objects in the Northwest Coast, it was a special, a special color that was the prerogative of chiefs. And one of the reasons why is because it was an expensive color. Oftentimes you'd have to trade for your blue. And sometimes people were very protective of the sources and they had to go way out of their way to get the different things that would produce the blue color. And one of them was copper. So there was copper oxide that got traded and used. The reason why I used the blue in this role was it almost echoes that story about the chiefs and, and showing respect by showing the adorned uh, ear and then facing your enemy with your ear on adorned for the abalone earring. I wanted to use the blue because I felt like with that story, it would be such an instant uh, show of respect. The chief's robes have taken on a journey back when they were respected as spirit manifestations. And then the explorers came and the traders came from European countries and Spain and, and they collected these robes. They now, you can find these chief's robes all around the world in the different museums at least the Nahim, the Raven's Tale, you don't see that many in museums. A few people have different um, attitudes towards museums. Some people, especially through the Repatriation Act, they, they want to go and, and get their spiritual things back. And I hope that as many things that were taken from graves or from grave houses that, that they do get returned. But I'm also very grateful for the museums to take care of these really early pieces that got collected in like the 1790s, uh, the 1780s. Now I get to go and, and visit these robes um, through the museums. This is an example of a Nahin robe, what is commonly called a Chilkat robe. And you can see that the weavers advanced their techniques so that from the geometric patterning of the raven's tail, they moved into having the ability to do the, the circles and the ovoids. The chief's robe that I'm weaving, the style is a raven's tail and it predates these Nahin robes. Years ago, when a chief would pass, they often would put these robes on their memorial houses. In the old days, people would burn their regalia and their special properties uh, at death. That is why I think you don't see too many of these ribbons tails in museums. They were not collected because there weren't any really available. 
I'm standing underneath an example of a memorial post. And this was one of the um, styles that was put up to memorialize a chief. And his design would be on that rectangular front right up there. And it again was a place where uh, ancestry was proclaimed and stories were told. Our villages were along the beaches and we were canoe people. And when we went places, we would take our big canoes and the chiefs would sit on the box. There would be a chest or a box where all of his valuables that he was transporting would be on that box. One of the important treasures that was uh, tucked into those boxes would be his regalia, his chief's robes and his chief's headdresses and rattles. And when they arrived, they wouldn't just go straight to the front of the beach. They would first go off where they weren't seen and then they would dress in their uh, very fine uh, regalia and then they would be ready to be received and enter into another person's domain. So our robes were a big part of our presentation. There's a design with the raven's tail that uh, is called the box within the box and it's one of the concentric patterns that I'm going to be using for the robe. These houses are built in a very rectangular square manner with the polygon fronts. The houses contain the clans as well as all the clan treasure. So those designs that are in the raven's tail robes the box within the box and the concentric patterns. I think they're symbolizing the houses. They're symbolizing the treasure chests. Our houses were built with these massive cedar timbers and massive house posts, just like the one back here. And it would declare, just like our clothing, it would declare our uh, identity and our prestige and our ancestors. On the raven's tail, there's always positive and negative. Yes. In, and the same thing with the Nahim. There's always the positive and negative. You would never put uh, yellow by yellow. My mother talked about balance, and that balance was really important for our art. And I think that the swift robe is really an excellent example of balance. The basic technique that make up this robe is just a simple two-strand twining. And right here I'm doing a two-color two-strand twining. It very much evolved from basketry. In the old days, passing these techniques on were very important. So this is a cresting wave pattern. Hi, Unga. Oh, okay. That's what you'd say in Haida? Yeah, for, for a stormy sea. Hi, um, Unga. Hi, Unga. Yeah, it means the cresting wave is breaking. But this cresting wave, when I was planning that pattern, I wanted to put the power of the water in there. And so I put the hood of the raven's pattern and that has that wave look to it. Uh -huh. So that's what I did with the blue side. On the other side, I put the power of the sky. I really feel like these sky robes were robes that people used to maybe influence the weather. What do you think? I really never thought of it in that way. I just was so amazed that they discontinued making them because the Nahin robes are so masculine and these raven's tail robes are so feminine. It just amazes me that they would just all of a sudden stop doing that. All the tribes, not just yeah. the Haida, everybody. Everybody dropped it and it was like forgotten for so long. When I worked with Cheryl and got, did that apprenticeship with her, she was working on her monograph about the raven's tail weaving mm. and it was something we never saw before. So yeah. we were the first ones to be with Cheryl to be weaving it. 
Well, I helped my mother do her robe, Raven's Tail robe, many years ago when I was just beginning. And that was a good experience. So I'm really, really fortunate to pass this on to my daughters. In fact, my oldest daughter, Carrie Ann, she has been assisting me with my robes ever since she graduated from university. She came to my house and studied with me. I feel very fortunate to be part of this um, weaving family. There has always been weaving in my life from my various earliest memories of being at my great-grandmother's house, the smell of cedar, and um, my aunties weave, my nanny, my grandmother weaves, and my mom was always an artist. But then in my adult life, she uh, started weaving. The last time we wove a raven's robe together, my sister was even here um, with us. We were up in Masset and we had our young children and then they would see us weaving all together. Um, I'm just really happy that I have this legacy to carry forward. In the robe, the robe is called a sky robe in our language. So I've been doing a lot of research about why are these robes called sky robes. And in my research, I found out that the Skaga, the medicine men, they had a very important role. The Skaga would go onto the canoes and then they were expected to smooth the water to, to help get the help of the spirits and to honor the spirit of the sea. I'm a weaver of the raven's tail technique as well as the Nahin technique. And I think both these robes were used to be in alignment with the spirits. Early on, we had so many epidemics that really uh, cut our population down drastically. The epidemics came swiftly, and so we lost a lot of our, our elders and our people who could pass down this knowledge. I believe both those chief styles were very spiritual. Even the material was spiritual, like the mountain goat itself was considered a spirit helper for the Skaga. So having the robes be made out of the mountain goat wool was another element of spirit incorporation into those robes. Another thing would be the dye. I talked about the yellow and the black and the blue. Each one of those dyes was set with urine. So that was the mortant that would hold the dyes that urine was a substance they felt that was protective. There was a belief the land otter was considered an evil spirit. They were able to take your soul. So in order to prevent that, the hunters and the people who were going to go into um, an area where they knew the land otter was, they would make sure that they had some urine on them. And for the dyes to be set by this urine, there is another way that the spiritual elements were incorporated into the robe. Another thing is cedar. The cedar was considered a restorative element. Even in some stories, they talked about somebody who had died and that they rubbed and put over the body these cedar capes and that restored the person. So it wasn't just the patterns, it was also the actual material. When I am spinning the cedar into the warps, now in contemporary time. I'm not only making those warps stiff, I'm also bringing in a power that came from my ancestors. And so I think it's wonderful that all my ancestors sandwiches in the center designs. And that becomes the tree shadow, the reflection of the trees. We live on an island and the weather is very powerful. So we have a lot of natural powerful elements. But in our culture and in our stories, we talk about the supernatural. And there is stories about the wealth bringer, the monarch of the sea. He would come up and he would be house-like out of the water. And if you saw him, he would bring you wealth. One of the most supernatural elements was copper. So here I put copper within this central design and then copper within the treasures. Nowadays, when we're talking about quantum physics, we're getting closer and closer to uh, how the Skagas thought of the power in the water, in, in the sky, and within our world.
This robe could have been even collected earlier than 1800. Captain Benjamin Swift was there along that coast earlier than 1800. He was one of the earliest people. You could see in the black border here what a warm brown it is, almost purple. It's just a really warm brown, and I can tell that they used the indigenous dye recipe of the hemlock in the alder. This chief's robe, the raven's tail, has no cedar in it, not like the Nahin. The Nahin, all of the warps would have the cedar in it. So I wanted to add cedar to my creation, and so I decided that the ties that will tie these sides together, I would spin the cedar into the warp so that it has that healing element. Traditionally, our robes were designed often with rows and patterns of shells. So when the explorers and the people came from outside the cultures, they brought the buttons. And so nowadays, when you go to a feast, you'll see the red and blue robes, and they'll have the designs made by the lines of buttons. And so I wanted to include some buttons. Another thing that I really never touched on is how important and unique this technique is as far as the weaving down. Most world cultures weave up where our techniques of weaving these chief's robes, both the Nahin and the raven's tail, is we wove down. So that is another really unique part of this technique. The chief's robes are topped with this wonderfully soft sea otter fur. That is a traditional finish to the robe. Today, there is revival. So often these robes you'll see dancing. Another addition that's traditional to this style is to have the tassels. I created that illusion of fuller warps by using a special tassel technique that will help the movement as these robes dance. So you'll see the tassels swinging when the dancers move. I want to acknowledge that we gather today on the historic homelands of the Massachusetts and the people of the Wapanoag to witness the presentation of the raven's tail robe in dance. Evelyn Vanderhoop began weaving the robe a year ago. And I'm just so honored to be able to weave the Chief's Raven's Tail robe for this museum. I would like to thank the Stonington Gallery who worked with the Museum of Fine Arts.